prepare ourselves for the Word of God this morning, and today we are going to be doing something a little different. We're going to be speaking on the book of Philemon, a story of love and action. And I'm going to be teaching this morning instead of preaching, and I know you've heard me say that from time to time, but this one is going to be a little different. It's going to sound more like a Bible study than a sermon, but I trust and hope that we will get something out of it. The book of Philemon is a very short book of the Bible. It's basically one chapter. Let's just read through the book of Philemon. The book of Philemon. This letter is from Paul in prison for preaching the good news about Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. It is written to Philemon, our much-loved co-worker, and to our sister Aphia and to Archippus, a fellow soldier of the cross. I am also writing to the church that meets in your house. May God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. I always thank God when I pray for you, Philemon. Because I keep hearing of your trust in the Lord Jesus and your love for all of God's people, you are generous because of your faith. And I am praying that you will really put your generosity to work, for in so doing you will come to an understanding of all the good things we can do for Christ. I myself have gained much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because your kindness has so often refreshed the hearts of God's people. That is why I am boldly asking a favor of you. I could demand it in the name of Christ because it is the right thing for you to do, but because of our love, I prefer just to ask you. So take this as a request from your friend Paul, an old man now in prison for the sake of Christ Jesus. My plea is that you show kindness to Onesimus. I think of him as my own son because he became a believer as a result of my ministry here in prison. Onesimus hasn't been of much use to you in the past, but now he is very useful to both of us. I am sending him back to you, and with him comes my own heart. I really wanted to keep him here with me while I am in these chains for preaching the good news, and he would have helped me on your behalf. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent, and I didn't want you to help because you were forced to do it, but because you wanted to. Perhaps you could think of it this way. Onesimus ran away for a little while so you could have him back forever. He is no longer just a slave. He is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you both as a slave and as a brother in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, give him the same welcome you would give me if I were coming. If he has harmed you in any way or stolen anything from you, charge me for it. I, Paul, write this in my own handwriting. I will repay it. And I won't mention that you owe me your very soul. Yes, dear brother, please do me this favor for the Lord's sake. Give me this encouragement in Christ. I am confident as I write this letter that you will do what I ask and even more. Please keep a guest room ready for me, for I am hoping that God will answer your prayers and let me return to you soon. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. So do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, and Luke, my co-workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. The book of Philemon is one of the shortest books of the Bible, and it talks about a runaway slave. The nature of the book is unlike any other book of the New Testament, any other writings of the Apostle Paul. He doesn't give really any additional uh, theological instructions. He's not speaking to matters in the church. He's not addressing any kind of conflicts within the church or administration. It's strictly a personal letter from one person to another. Because of that, many have even wondered why is this book even in the Bible? And so because of the nature of the book, we're not going to necessarily go verse by verse, but we're going to use it as an opportunity to give some of the historical background to 
the first century church, the climate and the customs of the early church, and hopefully that will enhance your understanding in other versions, other passages, other portions of the scripture. The book of Philemon is written to a man who was evidently wealthy, and as a wealthy man, he had a number of slaves. And Onesimus was one of those who evidently ran away from him. We don't know the entire story about it. Uh, there are some people that say that he not only ran away from him, but he stole from him. We don't really have that kind of evidence that Onesimus stole anything from him. In fact, Philemon says in verse 18, if he has harmed you in any way or stolen anything from you, charge me for it. So it doesn't sound like he necessarily stole anything. However, because he was a slave and because he ran away, he probably did do some financial economic damage to Philemon. It may have very well cost him in business transaction or property maneuvering or what have you. So he cites that, but anyway, it's a runaway slave who meets up with Paul, and Paul sends him back with a letter. Well, let's look at our New Testament. And the New Testament is comprised of 27 books. And let's talk about how are these books arranged? How did they place them in order? Well, they placed the uh, Gospels in the front, and the first three are known as the Synoptic Gospels. They're placed in that order because the early church, the first, second, third century churches, actually thought that they were written in that order. Since then, they have found out that they really weren't. Mark was actually the first one. Luke is actually part one of Acts. Synoptic means the same, from the same point of view, and so they are similar. These three go together, and then there is the fourth gospel, a very profound, somewhat mysterious book. Many attribute it to the apostle John. Those who know me know that I attribute it to someone else other than the apostle John. But the fourth gospel is very different than the other three. There is a ton of stuff that's in the fourth gospel that you don't find in the other gospels. There are things that are in the synoptic gospels that do not appear at all in the fourth gospel. So it's a very different book. After the gospels, we have the historical book of Acts, it is the only history book in the New Testament, not counting the Gospels, which may have some historicity, but not really. Remember, the Gospels basically cover the last three years of Jesus, and out of those three years, it focuses on the last week of Jesus's life. So it's not a whole lot of chronology history in the Gospels. Acts is the only historical writing of the New Testament. Unlike the Old Testament, where you had Ezra, Nehemiah, the kings, you had a bunch of historical writings in the Old Testament. The New Testament only has one, the book of Acts, which is the actions of the Holy Spirit through the apostles. So it's the Acts of the Apostles. But even with that, it does not cover all of the apostles. It basically starts with Peter, and then moves predominantly to Paul. And so there you have the book of Acts. Then we have what's called the Pauline epistles or Pauline letters. An epistle is a letter. And we have a number of letters written by Paul. How were these books arranged? Believe it or not, they were actually arranged by size. So it goes from the longest book to the shortest book. And so hence Romans appears first and Philemon appears last. They go by size order, that's why they are listed in that order. There is a glitch with Ephesians and Galatians, however there's a technical reason for that which we won't get into. So they're basically arranged by size. 
After the Pauline epistles, we had the book of Hebrews. And Hebrews, again, is one of those mysterious books. Many thought that it was written by Paul, and in some of your Bibles, it might even say an epistle of Paul to the Hebrews. It is unlike the others in very many ways. It's very philosophical. It's very Greek-oriented. And most scholars believe that it was not, in fact, written by Paul, but by someone else. And no one really is sure of who the author of that letter is. A very common attribution is to Apollos. After Hebrews, we have a bunch of other epistles, James, Peter's, and John's, and Jude. Again, these are basically roughly arranged by size order. James and Jude are not to be confused with the apostles, James and Jude. This was not the apostle James who was long dead before these were written. This was the brother of our Lord Jesus and Jude, the brother of our Lord. Then you have Peter and the writings of John. And again, these are the people that they attributed them to, though some scholars doubt that Peter or the apostle John actually wrote anything. Then lastly, we have the book of Revelation, which we have touched on from time to time. It is the only prophecy in the New Testament. Again, the Old Testament, had a bunch of uh, prophecies, prophetic writings, such as Ezekiel, Isaiah, Daniel. In the New Testament, we only have one, and that is the book of Revelation. Well, let's turn now to the Pauline epistles. These here, again, arranged by size order, these make up about half of your New Testament. About half of Paul's writings were called contested, which means many scholars believe that Paul did not, in fact, write these at all, but they were rather written by a disciple or a follower of Paul. And we're not here to debate that issue now, but just note that many people feel that these are contested epistles. Then you have the uncontested epistles. The uncontested epistle, no one really doubts that Paul is not the genuine author of these books, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, and Philemon. And as you can see here, our book today, Philemon, is an uncontested book, meaning no one really doubts that Paul, the Apostle Paul, is the author of this book. Then we have what's called the pastoral letters, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. They're called pastoral letters because they were written to two of Paul's protégés, men that were going to follow in his footsteps. In these, while they are personal letters to personal people, they are full of instructions, do's and don'ts. This is what you need to do. Here is how you need to conduct yourself. Here is what you need to do with the churches that you're going to be overseeing. So they're known as the pastoral letters. The last book is 2 Timothy, and it is the last writing of Paul before he was executed. And he says, therefore, I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. And Paul was then executed by beheading in a Roman prison. Now we have four prison letters, and they are called prison letters, obviously because they were written from prison, one of his incarcerations. And they are Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and our book of Philemon. In Ephesians, he notes there, when I think of this, I, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus for the benefit of you Gentiles. Again, Ephesians, therefore I, a prisoner for serving the Lord. In Philippians, know that I am in chains because of Christ and because of my imprisonment. In Colossians, he notes, remember my imprisonment. And in Philemon, Paul, a prisoner of Christ Jesus and Timothy, our brother. So these were known as the prison epistles or the prison letters. Now, 
There is a correlation between, a interrelation between these four people and churches. The question becomes, where did he write these letters from? What prison? Well, we do know that Paul was in jail a lot. He states there in 2 Corinthians that I have been put in prison often. So while most scholars attribute that these prison letters were written while he was in prison in Rome, I, your humble correspondent, disagree with that, and I would say that he is more likely in a prison in Ephesus. Now, there are a bunch of reasons for that. We won't get into all of that, but just briefly, some of the reasons why I say that is because the Church of Philippi, Philemon, and Colossians were in the region of Ephesus. So it would make sense that he would have some correspondence in this neighborhood. Where you think of Rome was way on the other side, and just geographically, it would have been difficult for him to know or get that kind of correspondence of what was going on in the churches for him to respond with letters. Remember, they didn't have airplanes back then. And so to travel from the Ephesus region to Rome would have taken weeks. And so Paul is writing these letters in responses to things that are going on in the church, including Philemon. And so, again, it would have made more sense that he was in proximity of these churches where he could get constant communication. Also, when he's in his prison in Rome, he states there that the time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight, I finished a race, I kept the faith. So he's on death row and he knows that he's about to be killed. However, in Philemon, he says while he's in jail, please keep a guest room ready for me, for I am hoping that God will answer your prayers and let me return to you soon. So in this prison, he doesn't seem to think of it that he's never gonna get out. Now, we don't know that. There just seems to be that kind of inconsistency between the prison letters and the pastoral letters. If he's in Ephesus, he says things like, Apophras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you his greetings. So do Mark, Arist Aristocrat, do you know what I'm trying to say? <laughs> Demas and Luke, my co-workers. So Demas is there with him. In the book of Colossians, he mentions him again. Luke, the beloved doctor, sends you his greetings, and so does Demas. Well, when we get to the Roman prison, he says, Demas, having loved this present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Again, a lot can happen in six months, but there just seems to be somewhat of a different set of circumstances between this incarceration and the other incarceration. Now, as I said, these four letters are kind of interlocked, especially Ephesians, Colossians, and Philemon. And out of those three, there is a distinct relationship between the book of Philemon and the book of Colossians. We're going to look at some of that. Let's go to a map and see where we are. We're in Asia Minor, a long ways from Rome, and Asia Minor which is now modern-day Turkey, and there is the Isle of Patmos. Now, we know that from John's writings in Revelation to the seven churches of Revelation, the seven churches in Asia Minor. So we zoom in there, we find seven churches listed in Revelation. Now, as we've said before, there were certainly more churches than just these seven. There were many more churches in this region. Revelation just chose to write to seven specific churches. They were not the only churches in that region. If we zoom in even closer to one of those seven churches, we find the church of Laodicea. Well, some 20 miles from there was the church of Colossae. And just around the corner from that was another church, Heropolis. 
Now we find this from a book of Colossians, where it says, Apophras, a member of your own fellowship. So Apophras is a member of the Colossian community, the Colossian church. He goes on, he says, I assure you that he, Apophras, prays hard for you and also for the believers in Laodicea and Heropolis. So there he makes mentions of these other two churches in this region. Tychius will give you a full report about how I am getting along. So Tychius is bringing a report to the Colossians. He is a beloved brother, a faithful helper, who serves with me in the Lord's work. I have sent him to you for this very purpose, to let you know how we are doing and to encourage you. So Tychius is on his way and he's bringing this letter to Colossae. Now, who else goes to the church of Colossae? I am also sending Onesimus, a faithful, beloved brother, one of your own people. Well, Onesimus is the guy we're talking about in the book of Philemon. Well, evidently, he goes to the church of Colossae, and he is coming with Tychius, and he's delivering at least the letter to Colossae and maybe other letters as well. Onesimus and Tychius will tell you everything that's happening here. Who else goes to this church in Colossae? Say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord that you may fulfill it. Well, Archippus, where does that name sound familiar? In Philemon. The letter is written to Philemon, our much-loved co-worker, and our sister Aphia, and to Archippus. So Archippus goes to Colossians. So there's a few people that are in this Colossian church that are getting their names mentioned. Now here's where it gets interesting because he says he's a fellow soldier of the cross. I am writing also to the church that meets in your house. Well, what does this tell us? If all these people go to the church of Colossae and that church meets in his house, then it's very probable that the church of Colossae was in the house of Philemon. Let's talk about the house church. We read this often that a church is meeting in a house. To the saints that meet in your house and here we have the church which is the church of Colossae evidently that is meeting in the house of Philemon. Now when we think of a church house or church in a house we kind of think of what we have in today's culture, little home Bible studies. And so you're thinking about 20, 25 people, maybe 40 people that are gathered, squeezing into a living room, into a little house, and they're having churches. And that's a rather common thing. Many churches have actually started in somebody's living room. Many churches today, mega churches, have actually started in somebody's living room with 12 people and then they branch out. But that is our assumption and idea of a church house. When you say a church is meeting in a house, that's kind of the image that pops into our head. What we have to understand is that wealthy Roman people, wealthy Greek people, their houses were actually quite large. When you look at some of the pictures, and the archaeology, you'll see that their houses were very serious houses. Think of even Peter's house or Lazarus' house where the Last Supper was. When you had the Last Supper, you had at least 12 people at that table. That's not counting people like Peter's wives, if any, there were children, other servants, Lazarus, Mary, Martha. That's a lot of people in the house. So the the houses of the ancient world could be 
quite large that could very easily accommodate 50 to 100 people. So when you read in the Bible, the church that meets in your house, don't think of 15 people. You could very easily think of 200 people. Now, when Jesus says, upon this rock, I will build my church. So Jesus introduces the idea of a church. This is the first time the church appears in the New Testament. It's the only time that it appears in the Gospels. The Gospel of Matthew who mentions it three times. What is the format or the model of the church? What was the format or the model of the church? This is important and this is what I mean by that. When we think of a house, you're gonna buy a house, you're gonna rent an apartment, there is a format to those houses. In other words, when you have a house, anyone who has a house, there are certain expectations that you have about that house. For instance, they have a bathroom. They have a bedroom. They may have one bedroom, they may have three, they may have five bedrooms, but they have somewhere to sleep. They have a, some sort of living room or dining room. They have a kitchen. In other words, you don't buy a house and they say, well, this house doesn't have a bathroom. You have to go to the mall to use the bathroom. It's expected that every house ought to have a bathroom, okay? Every house ought to have some sort of kitchen facilities. Why? Because this is the model, this is the format for a house. You don't have to ask whether or not the house or the apartment that you rent does it have a bathroom. You kind of assume if it's a house, if it's an apartment, it will have that. Another example is a business. You want to start a business or you want to inquire about a business. There are certain familiarities, a product or a service. Every business will have a product or a service. They'll have a location. Even if it's a cyber location, there's a place where you, a point of contact. There's advertisements. There's employees. There may be employees. There'll be supervisors, managers. So for instance, if you're someplace, how many times have you say, I need to speak to a supervisor? Well, who says there's a supervisor? Because you just make that assumption that if this is a business, someone's in charge. You have a manager. I want to speak to a manager. Very rarely would you get there and say, oh, we don't have managers. We just kind of wing it ourselves. No. So there's a format that a business is built upon. So then what is the format for the church? What was the church's model to pattern itself after? The first assumption would be, what well, was the synagogue? That the church would follow the patterns and the model of the synagogue. After all, we had Judaism, and Judaism had several branches of their faith. The Pharisees, they had the Sadducees, a lesser known group, the Essenes. And so would it be that Christians would be a branch of Judaism? After all, Jesus was Jewish. All of the apostles were Jewish. The first converts and people saved were all Jewish. So why aren't we Jewish? Why aren't we just another branch of Judaism? Why aren't we more like the Jews? Why isn't the church more like a synagogue? If you were to walk into a synagogue, you would not, in fact, find a lot of similarities. You would find yourself being somewhat a stranger. Things that go on in a synagogue, their ways of worship, it's not like a church. It's rather different than a church. Well, how did that happen? Why did that happen? In the epistle of James, he actually picks up the pattern of the synagogue. There in his writings, he says, if a man comes into your assembly, with the gold ring and dressing in fine clothes. And he goes on. The word there, assembly, in the original Greek is in fact synagogue. So here the writer of James says, if a man comes into your synagogue. And so he borrows the pattern of the synagogue. He even addresses his letter 
James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes dispersed abroad. Greetings. Now, he's writing to Christians. He's not writing to Jews. How do we know this? Well, first of all, there were no 12 tribes at this time. Ten were long gone and out of existence. But he's calling the body of believers the 12 tribes of Israel dispersed. So James clearly is borrowing or using the format of the synagogue. And so if that be the case, then it would seem that Christianity would begin to mirror the Jewish faith. But in fact, Christianity does not because Christianity did make a break from Judaism. Now, there's a lot of reasons for that, which we won't go into this lesson. There's reasons on the Jewish part, where they basically didn't want us. And there were reasons on the Christian part, where we decided, the leaders, the, church, the churches, the apostles decided, you know what, we're really not like you guys. And so the church is not followed or patterned after the Jewish synagogue. So then what is the church patterned after? What is it that he's patterned himself after? When Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, did they all turn around and say, what's a church? No, they knew what that meant. The church was founded and patterned after two formats. The Greek ecclesia, and the Roman household. That's what the church was patterned after. Let's talk about the Greek ecclesia. A more familiar concept, ecclesia, again, when Jesus said, upon this rock I will build my church, he uses the word ecclesia. Well, they knew what that meant. When he said, upon this rock I'll build my church, they had an idea of what an ecclesia was because it was very common in that day and age. The ecclesia comes from Greece, and it was founded in Athens, and it basically means a town assembly, or what we might call city hall. It was the one of first and earliest forms of democracy. Now that democracy was not like American democracy. It was very different, it didn't include women, didn't include a lot of things. But it was the idea of a community-led people. So when Jesus said, I'm going to build my church, this was the first point of reference that they had. I'm going to set up a city hall. And so when we read things after the ecclesia model, for instance, in Matthew, if your brother sins, go and show him his fall in private. If he listens to you, you have won a brother. But if he does not listen to you, take one or two more with you so that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Again, this made sense. This is the format of the ecclesia. If he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be as a Gentile and a tax collector. The next one, which is not as familiar, is the Roman household. The church was patterned after the Roman household. So what is the format of the Roman household? The Roman household was built on a pyramid type of system. At the top of the pyramid was the patra familiar, or the head of the household. Now, the head of the household in the church is not the pastor, it's not the elders. The head of the household of the church is Jesus. In Colossians, he, Jesus, is also the head of the body, the church. And he is the beginning. In Ephesians 5, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is also the head of the church. But as the church is subject to Christ. So the Pacha Familia is Jesus. He is the head of the household, not the pastor. Now, what is the role of the pastor then? What's the authority of the pastors or the elders? The pastor or the elders, the leadership, however you are structured, is there to give you three basic things. One is for protection. The pastors are there to protect you against heresy, against false teachings. Pastors are there to provide for you, 
to nourish you with the word of God, to nourish you with prayer. And the pastors are there to promote you, to promote your gifts. Pastors are there to bring out the best of people, to recognize their gifts, to enhance people's gifts, to create opportunities for those people to exercise those gifts. So the role of the elders and the pastors are for these things. He is not here to be your supervisor. He's not here to be your boss. He's not here to be your cop or to police your life. He's there to bring out the best of you so that you could be the best Christian. If you have leadership that's not doing these things, then there's a problem there. That's not the format of the church. Now, underneath the head of the household is the immediate and extended family. When we think of a family and a household, we think of the wife, the kids, maybe a mother-in-law, maybe a grandma, but that's kind of it in, the, in that house. The Roman household included all of the extended family, the cousins, the nephews, the uncles, all of everybody there. And it featured also the elder son. Now, let's go to the bottom of the pyramid. At the bottom of the pyramid were slaves. Now, when we talk about slaves, we think of American slavery. American slavery was based on racism, hatred, and violence. It was based on cruelty. It was kidnapping people and enslaving them. That was not what New Testament slavery was. And that's important because there are people that use the Bible to justify this kind of slavery. You hear people say, well, Israel had slaves, and they actually used Philemon for one of those excuses. In fact, Philemon, very interestingly, is used on both camps. For those who were against slavery, they pointed to Philemon. And they said, look at Paul. He wrote to Philemon and said, don't do this to Onesimus. He's a brother. Treat him as a brother, not as a slave. Then the people who were for slavery pointed to Philemon. And they said, notice Paul sent the slave back to his owner. He didn't say, hey, good, you shouldn't have been a slave anyway, stay with me. No. He says, do the right thing, get back to your property owner. So the books of the Bible were used to justify our kind of slavery, but it was very different. In the New Testament, there are three words that were used, slave, servant, and bondservant. The Greek word for this was doulios, and they all were used interchangeably. And it had nothing to do with kidnapping people and forcing them into labor. Think of the parable of the talents. It says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip, and he called together his servants. There the word servants is duly also slaves, and entrusted his money to them. Paul calls himself a slave. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ. Again, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, calling themselves as slaves. Paul, a bond servant of God. The other word that's used is master or Lord. The word there is curios, and it's a word that Jesus actually used for himself. You call me teacher and Lord, curios, and you are right. For so I am. So here, the point is, is that slave and master was not always an ugly thing. It was not always a terrible thing. It had more to do with economics than with racism. So go back to your pyramid. The slaves are at the bottom. Above the slaves were what were known as freedmen. Not free men, but freedmen. These were men that were once slaves and who were emancipated, either set free or released from their debt, or they actually bought their freedom and they were set free. 
underneath the elder son, the extended family, and above the free men were, in fact, free men. These were associates. They could be like what we would consider employees. Now, here's the point. All of these people make up the household. All of these people are part of this household. So when we think of my household, and we're thinking of my wife and three kids, the household, the old Roman household, could actually consist of 150 people. The old classic movie of The Godfather. Now remember, the Italians were ascendants from the Romans. Listen to the language that's used relative to family. Barzini's people chisel my territory and we do nothing about it. Pretty soon there won't be one place in Brooklyn I can hang my hat. Just be patient. I'm not asking you for help, Mike. Just take off the handcuffs. Be patient. We gotta protect ourselves. Uh, give me a chance to recruit some new men. No. I don't want to give Barzini an excuse to start fighting. Mike, you're wrong. Don Corleone, you once said that the day would come when Tessio and me could form our own family. Till today, I would never think of it. I must ask your permission. Well, Michael is now head of the family, and if he gives his permission, then do you have my blessing? After we make the move to Nevada, you can break off from the Corleone family and go on your own. After we make the move to Nevada. How long will that be? Six months. Here you have the Don, who's a patre familia, the head of the household. And he's over all of these people. Notice you got grown men that are asking if they could start their own families. Now, they're not asking to get married or have kids. What they're asking for is to be broken off from this household and to start their own households. Now, when you see that and appreciate that, there are other scriptures that start to make a little bit more sense. For instance, when we go to the book of Acts, it says, a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged them, saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. And they went out of the prison and entered the house of Lydia. So again, this is not a little apartment. This is a, an entire community. Again here, the Philippian jailer, they said, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord and together with all who were in his house. And they took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds and immediately he was baptized he and his household and he brought them into his house and set food before them rejoicing greatly having believed in God with his whole household so again the Philippian jailer who got saved and baptized his whole household don't think of him and three kids think of an entire community this first church in Philippi could have broke out with 55 people. The Corinthian church was told some members of Cleo's household have told me about your quarrels, dear brothers and sisters. Chloe's household, members of Chloe's household gave Paul the information. It didn't mean Chloe. It meant members of Chloe's household. Chloe may not even have been part of this church, but members in Chloe's household could have been her servants or employees or family members. Paul to the Corinthians, now I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. So again, don't just think of him, his wife, and two kids. The Roman centurion, Cornelius, the first Gentile convert. Now there was a man of Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian consort, a devout man, one who feared God and all of his household. Again, not just his wife and kids. Here's a very interesting one. It says, all the saints greet you, especially of Caesar's household. 
Now, did we think that you had a Bible study going on with 12 people and Caesar was upstairs sleeping? No, this wasn't Caesar. This was members of Caesar's household. Now, this is what the church was founded upon because he says here, to those who are of the household of faith. Again, those who are of God's household. In Timothy, how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God. And Peter says, time for judgment to begin with the household of God. Now, there's another clip. This is an old classic, Ben-Hur. Now, when you see this clip, I want you to look at a couple of things. Number one, look, take your eyes off Charlton Heston, and look at his house. Note the size of his house and envision a church house in this setup. Also, he's talking to a slave, one of his slaves, and I want you to see the interactions, the relationship that he has with his slave. And they use, again, the language of the house. Master Judah, the caravan from Antioch. Yes, Admiral, I saw. Simonides. Welcome. Judah, oh. welcome, homecoming. Master. Simonides has brought gifts as usual. Amber and jade for me. Silk for tears. And for the master, Iberian wine. Not to mention the best gift of all. Your presence. You do your servant honor. I also bring good news from Antioch. The caravans from Petra. Have all arrived. Good. Here is the accounting. Well, what of Numidia? The trade route is ours, guaranteed by treaty with the king. Once a year you bring your accounting. Once a year I find myself wealthier. Yeah, but my greatest treasure is my steward. My life belongs to the house of her. Nothing else exists for me except my daughter. She must be a young woman by now. Yes, and your property. Oh. Since she was born the daughter of your slave. When I inherited you, I inherited a friend, not a slave. Still, Esther has come with me from Antioch to ask your permission to marry. Well, it's granted. Your permission, Esther wishes to speak to her master. Your husband will be fortunate. What is his name? David, son of Matthias. Of what house? His own master. He is a freeman. Tell me more about him. I have seen him only once. He is a merchant well thought of in Antioch. He will pay for Esther's freedom. Her freedom will be my wedding gift to Esther. You are generous, Master. So we see his slave that was part of Ben-Hur's household. This doesn't necessarily mean that he lived with him but he was part of that community. So when we get to Philemon and Onesimus, again, picture that in mind. Don't picture somebody tied up in his backyard who broke free and ran away. This was part of Philemon's community, which again is evidently the Church of Colossae. So here he uses a term, he says, Onesimus hasn't been much use to you. The name Onesimus actually means useful. And so he says, he hasn't been of much use to you, but now he has become very useful to both of us. If he has harmed you in any way or stolen anything from you, charge me for it. I, Paul, write this in my own handwriting, I will repay. We see here Paul showing what Christianity is about by mirroring what Jesus had done for us. He who knew no sin was made sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Paul is willing to live out the gospel the way that Jesus 
did with us. So we read in the scriptures, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ has forgiven you. Make allowances for each other's faults, forgiving one another who offends you. Remember the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Be ye therefore merciful as your Father also is merciful. So we see that Paul is demonstrating what being a follower of Jesus looks like. Being a follower of Jesus means he does the things that Jesus would do. And Jesus was willing to take and pay the price for your offenses. Paul says, I'm willing to do the same thing. I'm willing to take on the offenses. If this man has hurt you, then bill me. Give me the offense. Onesimus had ran away. Onesimus was a runaway slave. But you know, when we think about it, we're all kind of runaway slaves. You don't have to be of African descent to be part of the slave culture. When you think back on what God has set you free from, when you think back of the things that have kept you chained up, the things that have kept you bound, we're all runaway slaves. Some of us are running away now from our past. We're running away from things that have kept us bound. We're running away from addictions. Some of us are running away from alcoholism. Some of us are running away from unforgiveness, things that have kept us down, things that have kept us in bondage, and we're all running to Jesus. And when, when we find Jesus, he set us free. And who the Son sets free is free indeed. And so I came to Jesus just as I was when I was bound up, and he gave me a song that the angels can't sing. He made me redeemed, and he broke the chains. This is one runaway slave that has found his joy. This is one runaway slave that has found his peace. Thank God for the freedom of Jesus. Thank God for setting me free. If you love the Lord, give him a praise.